The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Dimensional Fund Advisors, ABN 46065 937 671, ASFL 238093, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. This series is brought to you by Dimensional Fund Advisors, a global leader in systematic investing. Since 1981, Dimensional has been applying financial science to investing and supporting financial professionals with time-tested solutions they can count on. The benefits of Dimensional investing can be accessed in a wide range of vehicles, from managed funds, to ETFs, to model portfolios. Dimensional works with financial professionals to deliver better results and help them grow successful, client-focused businesses through investment, client communication, and business strategy support. We call it Dimensional 360. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, very pleased to be running through this excellent conversation uh, around guiding clients uh, with an investment philosophy. I'm joined here by two brilliant guests. Uh, I have Catherine Creasy from Capital Partners and David Hines. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Brendan. Good to be here. Good to be here. Excellent. Well, look, I wouldn't mind if we could just jump in with a quick bit of introduction. Uh, if you could, uh, maybe David, I'll start with you. Would you mind uh, introducing yourself to the audience? I suspect that many of our listeners would know who you are, but in case they haven't met you, uh, please get, go on. Thanks, Brendan. Um, my least favourite topic, talking about myself, but um, <laughs> for context, I think it's important. So 33 years in financial advice, wealth management, starting in 89 through sort of small, medium and large businesses. I like to think that I'm somewhat of an early adopter. Uh, got our own license in 95, went fee-based in 99, did a large merger that some of the listeners might be familiar with in 2008 to create Shadfall Financial Group, where we took 13 businesses around Australia, three in Brisbane, three in Sydney, three in Melbourne, one in Tassie, two in Perth, and, and merged them all together uh, script for script in a um, in a merger. Day one was you know, roughly $8 billion in assets, $80 million revenue, $25 million EBIT. Um, we we're able to grow that over the next six years to $13 billion in assets, $160 million revenue, $58 million EBIT, and ultimately got taken over by Insignia. Um, in late 2014. Um, since then, I've been consulting to the industry, my consultancy uh, called Global Advisor Alpha, so the global being global, uh, doing work in many countries, uh, the advisor being business to business, um, dealing with financial advice firms, not mums and dads and clients, and the alpha piece teaching, or we'll trying to teach advisors how to add the real proper value uh, above the line around the goals, the values, um, and not just the investment piece, which is I guess, relevant to today's conversation. More recently, we've brought some significant money out of America to Australia to start taking significant minority positions in wealth management firms and helping them to grow. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Brendan. Excellent. Thank you, David. Um, Catherine, over to you. I feel we are in very esteemed company now. Um, my background <laughs> is a little less varied. So I, um, I started out in financial services, actually, in marketing for a, a bank and was there for just a few years before I switched over to stockbroking. So I spent eight years at a broking firm in Perth and obviously um, very heavily focused on investment. Uh, but when I decided that wasn't for me and started looking around for something else, I found um, a business in Perth called Capital Partners and decided to give financial planning a go, uh, which was very difficult for a person who had come from stockbroking and investment only. Uh, but as it turns out, it has been a much, much better fit for me. So I've been with Capital Partners for almost 10 years now. Um, we're a self-licensed firm in WA. There's about um, 40 people, no, almost 50 people now across the team. And I am an advisor there. I've got about 60 of my own clients but I'm also head of advice, so I look after the quality of advice and um, training and technical learning for our advice team, and I'm also a responsible manager. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, I think I'm also in a STEM company here as well between the two of you. So 
Now, look, can I, I'd love to start this this conversation with you. Uh, you know, being being uh, on the ground in the role that you're in, and coming from you know broking of all places, uh, it sort of really sort of puts a spotlight on this whole issue of investment philosophy. And I, I just I would just like to start with you and help maybe unpack what it is that we're talking about here. You know, how would you describe what an investment philosophy is and maybe just a first brush on, you know, why this is something that you think is important in the client advisor relationship? Yeah, I guess an investment philosophy is a, is almost like a guiding light for all of our investment decisions for clients. And what I like about it is it sets the tone for a lot of the things that we're doing, but for also the the core of the um the thing that we do for clients, which is how we manage money. And I know that a lot of the time we say, oh, um, you know, what we do is provide them with peace of mind and and absolutely that, you know, we do all of those secure um things for our clients. But the biggest risk for any business is how you manage the client's money, right? So I think having an investment philosophy means that you've got something to anchor to and a, a way to be making decisions for your clients over a, a long, long period. Having, Do you want me to, should I just dive in a little bit to what it was like in Broking? Oh, look, I think contrasting those two approaches, maybe from where you are now to, to what things started out at in your Broking role, uh, would be great. Absolutely. Yeah. The, that I, I think in Broking, it's very ad hoc. You're sort of you're obviously deciding is West Farmers this year going to be better than Woolworths or whatever two stocks you're picking. You're deciding this one is going to outperform, and therefore that's what I'm going to load up my clients. Um, load up for my clients, and invariably one wrong decision, and you can blow everything up. And I I look at portfolios that come into us, um, you know, people that are seeking advice and they've got, and everyone will have seen it, right? Every advisor, they've got 20 different Australian shares. And sometimes I look at it and go, geez, this portfolio has done really well. But then when I look in the minutia of it, if they didn't have CSL, they would have been well, well behind the market for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it might be. And it just goes to show that there is, there is a level of expertise required in managing money and diversification is very, very key. Being able to have a philosophy that you can anchor to then means that you can focus on all of the other issues for your clients. So coming from that, where I did not feel confident that I could be picking the five stocks or the 10 stocks or whatever it was that were going to outperform the market, coming to Capital Partners and having an investment philosophy already embedded within the business made me so comfortable and confident that we were doing the right thing for our clients. And it makes, it makes, I think it makes us all better advisors and it, there's consistency. It means that every, across the business, you've not got the client you speak to the most getting better investments than the one who, who you already see once a year. Yeah, Absolutely. I think what what I'm taking from what you're saying is that you know initially in broking, what you're really hoping for is something that you can't hand on heart deliver to your clients, and that's something that you need to have your own internal confidence about so that you can execute properly in in your advice role. Absolutely, David. What about for you? You know, when I say investment philosophy, what what comes to mind? What do you think that is? Uh, maybe what do you think that isn't if you've uh, seen some people maybe espouse it, but you think they're off the mark? And, and why do you think this is an important piece of the advice process? Well, I, I think, you know, advice as we, we're all part of this emerging profession that's come from over the last 30, 40 years, stockbroking, risk insurance, uh, you know, financial planning, accounting, legal, and we're sort of morphing into this uh, profession. I think where this all started out years ago was primarily around the sale of product and uh, those products, uh, you know, manufactured typically by the asset managers, um, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, financial advisors were described as distribution for asset managers. You know, that's all, all changed today. Um, and I think advisors need to have a set of beliefs. Uh, I just happen to think that they need to have a set of beliefs that they can rely on, that it's based on some form of evidence and research. But, you know, I don't think there would be 
many advisors at all, if any, that are trying to do the right thing by their client and to get a great outcome. Um, what's important is, uh, if depending on the size of your business, being able to do that at scale uh, with multiple advisors, with multiple offices, uh, with consistency. Um, but ultimately, all of our clients are taking some form of risk, whether it's 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20, 90, 10. And as a result of taking the risk they're undertaking, they're entitled to a certain return. You know, there's a there's a benchmark return that they're entitled to. Let's let's keep the conversation simple and easy now and say if they invest in the Australian share market for the last 20 years, they're entitled to, let's call it a 10% return on the ASX 200. Most advisors are absolutely trying to get that to beat that to add value. But the question is whether they're actually doing that. And it's only when you take the helicopter up to 30,000 feet and back test the outcomes and the results that you can see that in many cases, certainly in our case, you know, back in the early 90s, mid 90s, late 90s, that we were, you know, notwithstanding the intent to try and deliver value to our clients, we were detracting value. And it was only when you, you know, peel the onion back and do that benchmarking work, you realise that there's a better way for your clients to get an outcome than you try to pick stocks, time markets, and throw darts at the dartboard, and notwithstanding that you're trying to add value. So for, for us, it's around having a set of rules. I think, yeah, Catherine described it well as, you know, the North Star, the, the guiding point there's a set of rules. And, and so starting by asking yourself some questions around, you know, what are your beliefs? Um, you know, can our team articulate it? Is it based on investment or based on some form of speculation? Um, do we believe in tactical asset, asset allocation or strategic asset allocation? And whatever you're going to land on from a belief perspective, can we put our hand on the heart and say that here's the evidence that that will produce, you know, all things being equal, will produce value add for our clients? Um, and I do think a really important part of this investment philosophy is whatever you land on, you know, different people have got different beliefs and that's fine, but are you able to back that up and measure that and, and actually demonstrate and articulate value? In our firm, you know, shed forth when you, when you merge 13 businesses and have you know, 26 egotistical principles. And, and I say that in a nice way. Everyone's got their own view on their investment philosophy and, you know, 80 to 100 advisors. Um, we had a rule and the rule was, don't put your hand up and say, I reckon, you know, I reckon this and I reckon that. You need to be able to support whatever your argument is with evidence rather than opinion. So for me, they're the, they're the, the core... I guess the core philosophy, the core reasons, the core rationale around building that philosophy, and you know, it takes some time to build out, but that's the that's the why 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 it needs to be built. Yeah, that, that, that's excellent, David. And thank you for that. And Catherine, if throwing to you, practically speaking, you know, what does this look like in your firm? I mean, it's one thing, I guess, to be compelled to the idea. Yeah, great. I should go and articulate these beliefs that I have around investments, or, or you know, I've got a view that asset allocation is the better way to go or indexing is the be better way to go or whatever it is. But once that's done, what does it look like? I mean, are we talking about a produced document? Is this a two-page flyer? Is it a, you know, 40-page deep dive? Is it a is it a presentation? How, how does it land for you in your business and in your interactions with clients? Well, I mean, I suppose it starts with our investment committee and they set the tone and they do the research and they um, set. So like David um, mentioned, you know, we do believe in evidence-based investing. We don't, I, I love that concept of no one can say, I reckon, because that is so true. I really I find it frustrating when someone says, oh, but the stats say, and you're like, well, what stats? Um, but anyway, so we, yeah, evidence-based is really important for us. And so the investment committee sets that tone and there are people who have ideas from time to time, but there has to be a level of rigor that go that, that goes through. So for example, we had sort of um maybe five years ago that the um the move to ESG investing. And so everyone starts asking about it, but it's not something that we can just throw and say, okay, now that's what we're doing. It goes through the investment committee, they look at the evidence, they look at the research, they make a plan and a philosophy for our organization. And then it trickles down to the team. So they set what the investments are and what the portfolio should look like. It's trained out through our team. 
um, we we live it with our clients. You know, we make sure that that's part of our initial um, discussions with clients so that they know what we believe and what we're going to give them. And I, you know, often you will have people come in who say, I want returns of 20% or this is, I want this or I want that. And I say, you know what, this is, this is what we're going to deliver to you. We're going to deliver something that is safe and secure. And when the market goes up and down, it will go up and down too. But over the longer term, it will allow you to achieve your goals. And I can really confidently say that because we can look at the evidence um, and there is a really long-term, um, you know, there is long-term evidence that markets work. And so we make sure that that is what is the belief and the understanding throughout our entire team, which flows to our clients. And we reinforce that messaging with them, you know, through our communications, through obviously that, Every time we meet with them, these are the sorts of things that we need to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's excellent. And I guess if I was to play devil's advocate, because um, I think what you said sounds really robust, right? Um, and maybe smaller practices don't have something that concrete. They might not have an investment committee. Uh, they might not have that sort of more structured approach to processing investment ideas. You know, might come by the sounds of what you just said. Uh, if I was an advisor and I wanted to incorporate ESG, it would go up through the investment committee and then be thought through and looked at all the evidence. And I mean, that sounds excellent. But I suspect maybe that some of our listeners might say, well, yeah, that that's all fine. But what's the value for that ultimately? Maybe instead what I'll do is, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable talking about investments on the fly. I'll just address it, whatever questions my clients are coming with. They say they want 20%. I'll talk them down. I don't need to go through this exercise of clearly articulating an investment philosophy. It's something that I can just, you know, do on the go. What what would you say to someone who's sort of starting from that position compared to maybe the position that you're in? Uh, there's a there's a whole bunch of things. And I think I sort of would challenge the notion that if you're a small business and only have one or two advisors, that you couldn't still have an investment committee and a level of regard. And it's that it's that notion of time in the business versus time spent on the business. And I would think the investment philosophy and making sure that you're making really good decisions would be part of that time spent on the business. And, you know, we've recently um, just bought a really small um, business, well, not really small, but we've bought a small business, which was basically two advisors, um, a fellow who's looking to retire. And I can, you know, say with confidence, they sat down um, quite monthly and they went through their investment philosophy and they looked at what it was that they were anchoring to and what they were doing for clients. And so, and they had very clear, they had clear process around that. So, and they kept, and they documented it and they could go back to any previous month and know what the decisions were that month or what they looked at for their clients. So I think that you can, you can do it, but you have to make the time. The second part of it is, again, if you're small, do you want to grow? Because I I think it can be somewhat impossible to grow if you're being really ad hoc with your clients. I don't necessarily think that you're doing the best thing for them if you're being ad hoc, because if you make a decision for one person and then six months later, you're making different decisions for different people. Well, what is it that is actually the, like, what is actually the right decision? What do you actually believe? And did you give your best cooking, um, to quote my friend, David Andrew, to the first person or to the last person. And I think the having the investment philosophy, implementing it the same way, allows me to hand on my heart whenever I have a client come in, know that they we're doing our best for them. This is what our current best thinking is. And I'm definitely delivering that for you. And there's going to be changes from time to time, you know. We might move what the allocation that we have to Australia, or we might need to switch out. Um, you know, whatever might happen, and it might be that for one person, that decision is largely um, based on their CGT position, and that's okay because you know tax cost is real. But we need to have a framework for making those decisions, and I think even if you're a small business, setting up your business that way, having a framework. Um, being really clear about what your investment philosophy is, benchmarking it, delivering it, reviewing it. That is how we meet our obligations for our clients. If asset comes knocking on the door, you want to know 
that you have the way that you have structured someone's portfolio is in their best interests and you can be really clear that that's what you've done for a you know your client base because that's what you believe in and here's the philosophy that you are anchoring to yeah that's that, that's excellent Catherine um David I wonder if you have any thoughts on this as well yeah look h- high level wise I, I think ultimately we're all in the business to deliver value to clients and that value can come in many ways um, I, I simplistically separate the value in this imaginary horizontal line we talk about below the line and above the line below the lines the money the product the investments the shares uh, the mortgages the risk insurance etc and above the line is the the goals the values the outcomes you know the why and and so you know what we're talking about today is below the line the investment philosophy you know why what does it look like how do you build it how do you articulate it we we need to be able to deliver value both below the line and above the line if you can't articulate your value in business, you know, whether you're small, medium or large, whether you want to grow or whether you don't, if you can't articulate your value, then you've got a problem. And the reality is, notwithstanding, there's less advisors today than there was two or three years ago. Um, I think the top 10 clients for any of our businesses are on somebody else's top 10 prospect list. And you need to be able to articulate and demonstrate the value that you're delivering to them. So, you know, I, I agree that, that growth is typically important, um, but maintaining your clients is important as well. But what's more important than any any of that is being able to articulate and demonstrate value to your clients. And I think that's where this investment philosophy piece comes in. You you mentioned a couple of moments ago, uh, Brendan, around, you know, what does it actually look like? I think you can break that down into two parts. There's, you know, how do you build it and, and what does it look like once it's built? And, and and so, yes, we might go through a process of investment committees, sort of internal, external, to, to work through the process of building it. But the, the outcome may start off with five or six or seven key bullet points. Uh, and then you might build that from, from your bullet points into a, a PowerPoint deck that might start off at, you know, five or six slides. And then you might build that out to 30 or 40 slides. Now, just because you've got a deck of 30 or 40 slides doesn't mean everybody wants to see that and hear that, you know. I think it's really important to to build it out, but then you say to your clients and prospects and centers of influence, we've got this investment philosophy piece that I'd like to talk about, which I'm like the short version, the medium version, the long version. And I can guarantee if you ask that question, 99% will say, give me the short version. And if I want to know anything else, I'll let you know. So you're asking for permission to give them a two or three minute summary rather than a, a two hour summary in a 40 slide PowerPoint deck, but you've got that built just in case. You've got the... You know, it might morph from that PowerPoint deck into a, a white paper that could be a two or three page summary, and it might end up a, a you know twenty or thirty or sixty deck with appendices uh, investment philosophy. And ultimately, um, one of my coaches said to me in the early nineties, "There's no point having original thought in a routine situation. You know, once you build out these uh, philosophies, I would say, what, why would we give someone a 60-slide PowerPoint deck or a 60-page uh, white paper when you can summarize that in a six-minute uh, YouTube? Uh, and so what we did was we we shot some videos that summarized all of those key points. We sent somebody a hyperlink a week, a week before the meeting and said, look, you know, watch this video if you get a chance. We're going to talk about our investment philosophy, what your portfolio might look like when you come in next week. They watch the video. They come in and say, look, did you have any questions from the video? You've covered off all of the key points in a six-minute video. And I look at you know, young advisors like Catherine and think, you know, they've got a 20, 30, 40-year runway in front of them. And I think if there was a tip that I would give some of the young advisors today is, you know, this notion of not having original thought in a routine situation, build your investment policy, build some systems and processing around it. You've got your PowerPoint, you've got your white paper, build the video, use the video to leverage your time. And so when that new prospective client comes in, you say, did you get a chance to watch the video? Yep. Uh, did you have any questions? No, that makes perfect sense. I'm really happy to do that. You've just saved yourself 60 to 90 minutes of repetition times five or six meetings per week, uh, times 48 weeks per year, times 20 years. And so not only is it more efficient for you, but you're probably articulating the points better in that six minute video because it's been done professionally. So uh, you know, there's, there's this ability to upskill and upscale and I, I think one of the key points for me is whether an advice firm small medium or large I do feel 
that you need to be growing to attract and retain a great team members, as an example. And it's the investment philosophy piece that holds people back. They can have the best intention to go and work on their client value proposition or their segmentation or their marketing or whatever it might be, but they continually get dragged below the line back into that investment philosophy when markets hit the skins, uh, you know, bond markets hit the skins, uh, share markets have a correction. They constantly get pulled back below the line. But my experience is if you've got this investment philosophy and you've built that out with your white papers, your PowerPoints, your videos, that your clients understand why markets are going up, why markets are going down. And it gives you that capacity release to move to other areas of your business, which is where the growth's going to come from. So it really, I, I guess I, um, I'd summarize all of that by saying it's like building a house. If you want to build a great house with you know, great rooms and great design, you've got to start off with a really solid foundation. And for me, this investment philosophy is the foundation that is going to enable, if, if you don't build it, you won't. You can have the best design of, of the house, but you won't be able to build it out because you get pulled that pulled back below the line. If you build it with the right foundation, that will give you the capacity release to work on everything else. Yeah, that, that's an excellent summary, David. And I know just personally from our practice, one of the benefits of having this uh, more cleanly articulated is it it does really help figuring out which clients are going to be a good fit for your practice. Because there are plenty of clients out there who, for you know, uh, reasons that we might disagree with, but could be completely legitimate, might just mean that their approach is entirely different to ours. And if that's the case, I would really rather know that <laughs> at the beginning of the process before people start investing uh, you know, money and time and energy into a relationship that isn't coming off a, a, a sort of firm foundation to begin with, like you say. Because if that crumbles further down the line because someone expected us to be able to predict the next, you know, drop in share markets and, you know, we haven't given them a call to say we should, you know, move them to cash or something like that. Well, then, you know, I, that that's something that I want to know. <laughs> uh, and I don't want that to happen, you know, on the fly without, you know, taking those sort of precautions and getting everybody on the same page. So I, I think that's just another benefit of this whole exercise, right, where you can get you get you can get people to opt in to the way that you want to operate, uh, rather than necessarily just trying to meet everybody's random investment beliefs or expectations when they walk through the door. I completely agree with that, and I think, like to your point, really, we're the advisors, and we, you know, it's not that we take, you know, you don't take the things from your clients. This is what I want to do. We're there to tell them if you want to achieve these goals this is the way that you should be thinking about doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Catherine, I'd love to hear from you. Have you got any examples that come to mind, uh, maybe in times of market distress, like David was just referencing, where you've really felt having a good investment philosophy has has helped you in an advice, re in an advice relationship, or maybe even it helped advisors on your team with their advice relationships with clients? Well, I think having an investment philosophy and having our clients really well versed in why we build the portfolio the way that we do means that when we have times of turmoil, our phone is not blowing up. Like people know, they're, like I've been told, they know, my advisor's been telling me this will happen. The market will go down at some point and you don't need to worry about that. And this is why we've got this level of you know um, wealth in safe, secure investments. We've got cash. We've got they know, and that's part of the the piece when you um, when you engage with a client and you go through the investment philosophy, and every time that you meet with them, you reinforce the messages. So we had a um, obviously COVID was a huge um, time of turmoil um, for everyone and and for investment markets particularly um, through March 2020, and that was I mean that's hugely significant, right? It was a huge drop, quite a, and quite rapid. And we got on the phone proactively to our clients, but I had one or two, I had one person who wanted to sell everything and there was no others. Everyone else was comfortable with the strategy that we had put in place. So it made our lives very easy, but it also made the conversation easy that 
now that the market is down and we're outside of our rebalancing tolerances, we are going to rebalance and we're going to sell some of the defensive inve- investments and buy growth investments. And, you know, by by and large, most clients were really happy to do that because, again, we've educated them. They understand why we invest the way that we do. And so then even though it might be a scary time, they understand why we would rebalance. Yeah, I think that's, think, yeah so that's fun. excellent. And, and it's good for younger advisors too. And particularly for, you know, me, someone who had seen a lot, you know, I worked in broking through the GFC and I saw so much wealth destruction. I like tell this story time and time again, but I sold down a client who had a million dollars worth of West Farmer shares and a, a margin loan against them and had to sell down the entire line knowing that that would go to pay off the loan and there would be no money left to pay the capital gain. And you know what people's capital gains on West Farmers can be like. And I never want to be in a position like that again. And obviously, you know, margin lending is its own beast. But just that um, that reliance on on one single thing and not having a philosophy, not having something to anchor to when times are really tough, you won't be able to sleep as an advisor. Now, I know it sucks when the market's down. No one likes to look at it. But the reality of markets is that they go up and down. And so as, you know, dipping into um, financial planning, when you're, you're young, having that philosophy, that's really going to help. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it, it's somewhat deceiving, right? Because you can get maybe a, sen- a false sense of comfort when markets are good and things are tracking up and, you know, returns are okay. It, it's very easy not to, you know, step in and say, hey, you know, just by the way, we don't know what's going to happen next year. Um, we want to make sure you've got enough protective allocation to meet your lifestyle funding or whatever. You know, I think I, I get the sense that maybe people don't do this because, you know, on a bright sunny day, well, who cares? Um, but, so but like, yeah, but like you say, you know, when, when the storm clouds are around um, and those decisions really, really matter and we're going to sort of send outcomes in a big direction one way or another, um, it, it's almost too late, right? Because it's so hard to change people's behaviours at that point where it, it's almost like an investment in and of itself to spend the time helping clients understand what it is that you're trying to do, how you expect you're going to respond, what you believe about how markets operate. Well, if you've got that all clear and you're reinforcing that over time, which you know you guys are clearly doing, then a rebalance in March 2020 just becomes so much easier and you're dealing with that as opposed to you know maybe going pulling everything out to cash. We had um, I've got a client who you know prior to 2020, she used to come in and every time I say, you know, the market's been really good and this is the return, but just to remember that it will go down and blah, blah. And one time she said to me, every time I come in here, you're always so negative and the portfolio is always so positive and why do you keep jinxing it? And I, and, but, you know, since the, since there's been a bit of turmoil, I think she's, you know, there's been no questions. She, she knows I told her many, many times, eventually this will happen. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, David, are there any sort of experiences either at a business level or at an individual client level that that come to mind that sort of really uh, hit this home for you personally? Uh, Sure. Um, Maybe some big picture ideas for the listeners before we drill down to a a client example or two. I I do think it's worth introducing the concept of speeder. Um, I don't know if we're able to get a, a, a hyperlink in the speaker notes on the podcast, but uh, SPIVA stands for Standard & Poor's uh, Index versus Active, and it's this sort of unofficial scorekeeper of this active versus passive debate. And I don't necessarily want to get into that debate today, but unless you want to. But but I think the key point, back to that word value, you know, it's all about adding value. And what SPIVA tells us, um, SPIVA's, SPIVA's been going since uh, 2004, and it measures outcomes in a whole bunch of countries around the world, particularly the developed countries, the developed markets. And basically, uh, paraphrasing the outcomes of SPIVA, it shows that 75% of professional a- asset managers detract value against the return to which the investor is entitled. I- in other words, um, only 25% are beating the benchmark. Now, there are other studies that say, okay, 
if there's 25 percent beating the benchmark why don't we just invest in those well they're different every year as well and so you know when we come back to this evidence-based approach there are a lot of studies that you can rely on i know today we're talking about an investment philosophy but i'd like to extend that a step further to an evidence-based investment philosophy where, where we've got the evidence that we can rely on so yes yeah, spiva data is part of that so the the other concept I'd like to introduce the listeners to would be that of Delbar, which is a company based in uh, Boston, US. Uh, Delbar measures the impact of human emotion in relation to investment returns. Um, and it, again, in simple terms, um, Delbar would show that if investors are entitled to a return on the S&P over a 20-year period of, of, let's call it 10%, that there's a behavior gap, which is typically three to five percent less than the return that the investor is entitled to. So if they're entitled to a return of 10 percent, uh, typically what the average investor is getting is in that sort of six to seven percent range, not the 10 percent. Why? Because they have emotion, because they get into markets at the wrong time and they get out of markets at the wrong time. And they're all reasons that we need to build out this investment uh, philosophy. And in my opinion, if we can extend that a step further to an evidence-based philosophy, which means we've got the evidence around how our portfolios have performed over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and so we can not just build out the actual performance, but we can show the best year, the best three years, the best five years, the best 10 years, and we can show the worst outcome as well. And so what Catherine's saying is you know, constantly preparing her client for yeah, in the good times, in, in sort of positive returns, that, that there will be a downturn at some point in time. And with that evidence-based approach, you're able to put the data in front of them and say, look, in this particular 70-30 portfolio, sure, the average for the last 20 years has been 7 or 8% per annum, but the worst result uh, over a one-year period in the last 20 years might, might have been minus 26%. How would you feel? If that happened, now that happens to be getting on the worst day of the worst month of the worst worst year in the last twenty years, but that's what you could achieve in this portfolio. How do you feel about that? And, and it's not a right or wrong, but it's a conversation. And and so extending this investment philosophy to that evidence based approach, it gives the clients more comfort and more reason to stay in their seat during difficult times, which eliminates this Delbar factor, you know, the human emotion, and ultimately gives the clients. Uh, a greater likelihood that they're going to achieve their goals and aspirations, which is what they're coming to see us about in the first place. If I give you, uh, you asked Brendan for a, a quick example, um, you know, as, as you start to build out your investment philosophy, there are certain things that you rule in, rule out and stand for or don't stand for. So uh, diversification would be one that would be in my investment philosophy. Now, some people might argue um you can pick up the BRW 200, the 200 wealthiest people, families in the country, and nobody has made uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars by investing in the XYZ balanced diversified fund. Uh, and that's true. Uh, but I would argue that the way to create real wealth is, is by having a highly concentrated position. You know, Every one of those people have made their hundreds of millions or billions by having highly concentrated positions in a particular business, a particular company. Uh, the way to make, the way to maintain that extreme wealth is through high diversification, um, and uh, but by by having diversification. So you know the example. You know back in '99, we had a client that had a net worth of three or four hundred thousand dollars, nothing significant, but he had a great idea, a great concept. Um, long story short, we floated that company through a backdoor IPO at two cents per share. That company went from two cents to five cents to ten cents within. 12 months, the share price had gone from $0.02 cents to $6. That person had a uh, a net worth, uh, which was once upon a time less than $400,000 within 18 months, a net worth of more than $500 million. Now, my advice was su suggesting that, you know, with young kids, he might decide to take $30, $40, $50 $50 million off the table, pay a bit of tax and put that in the bank account. Well, the short answer was, what would you know, David? You don't have a net worth of $500 million. I'm going to ride this and we're going to take over you know, BHP and Rio all in one go. Well, sure enough, the share price went from $6 to $5 to $4 to $3 to $2 and got wiped off the face of the earth. And that person today is is an employee in a company um, with the net worth that he started with um, 
some time ago. So the point I'm trying to make here is is an investment philosophy. You know, we need to have the key points to talk to around this notion of diversification. There's nothing wrong with high concentration. High concentration is going to help you to make uh, enormous returns if you get that right. But I think part of the advice proposition is moving, helping our clients to move their portfolios from highly concentrated, uh, perhaps family businesses uh, or stock options in a particular company that they're working for, and and over time to transition that from something that is going to have high volatility to something that's going to have a high probability to be able to support them and their families for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really powerful, pretty extreme example, David. <laughs> And I, I really like what you're saying here. And I think another benefit of this whole exercise is that it really does take you from the position that, like you said, David, before historically where this profession has come from, where it's the advisor distributing or, I don't know, pushing a certain line or method or product or whatever and delivering it to a client saying, well, this is what you need to have. You know, one of the things that I certainly find about working with a good, robust investment philosophy is that it helps put you on the same side of the table as the client. And it then becomes your job, um, like Catherine was saying earlier, is to provide your expertise to help them see all of these different moving parts and to navigate them really well. And like in your example, if you've got a very highly concentrated portfolio or you've got a you know private business that you're holding, and uh, I can certainly relate to that uh, amongst my client base, that you know, you know the risks that you're taking, and you and you're being deliberate and intentional about that, and you you've got someone else there to be a little bit more objective and look at your plan B and look at your plan C and like let's great, let's go for plan A, but what happens if that doesn't you know take place? And a good investment philosophy, I think, is just such a great tool to sit side by side with your client and say, well, what's the purpose of this money? Um, how, how what do we expect to come from? these particular assets? Is that sensible in light of what you're trying to do? And always the, well, what if things don't go the way we planned? What is likely to happen? How are we going to deal with that? Just to sort of give that more level of robustness to to the decision making, I think at an advisor level is really important. And then running that all the way through your business, Catherine, like you were saying, um, and making sure those ideas are, are really, really refined is just... Um, a really, really helpful part of adding value to clients um, that maybe you'd be tempted not to bother with, like like I was saying earlier. Um, Catherine, I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. I guess, all right, so ooh, thoughts on this. I, I agree with you, and I think the thing that I will sort of add to that, I, I've just been thinking about it as you've been talking, is this is the way that I invest as well. And I think that that's kind of a really important thing for your clients to know too, that you think the investment philosophy is really important. You think it's really important for them. And I do the same thing. I, you know, my superannuation is invested in exactly the same way as my clients is. And I suppose um, in terms of what you're talking about with diversification, I would say it's so classic to have that discussion with someone about what got you here is not necessary like is great but it's not necessarily what's going to secure your future and so being able to have the conversation about making sure that we're looking after the core of their wealth and what they need to um, achieve what what's important to them and it's so common that we have someone who has built up their wealth from a specific business or, you know, like it's it's classic with farming as well, and it's the concept of building the off-farm assets. Um, so, yeah, I I agree with what you've said, and I, I think that the investment philosophy piece in terms of moving forward for someone is really important. Excellent. Uh, as we sort of bring this to a, to a close and try and land the plane, I would I'd love to hear uh, from the two of you. Uh, you know, we've covered a lot of ground in this conversation but thinking about, you know, maybe maybe some of the younger um, or less experienced advisors who are tuning in, uh, or even the ones who have been around for quite some time, you know, w- what would be the main encouragements that you would that you would give in this area? If somebody's thinking about, or well, maybe listening to a speak, say, well, actually, I'm not sure how well I've articulated it. You know, I I could probably do the eight bullet points like 
David mentioned in my head, but I'm I'm not sure if I've actually got it on a slide deck anywhere. Or it's it's something that I know I've got, but I know that the other advisor in my business is a little bit different and, and we've never actually bothered to sort of thrash it out and come together on those hard points. You know, if someone's sitting there looking at this as an exercise that they want to do, but, you know, haven't done yet, maybe they're not quite too sure about how to go about it. What would be the main encouragements that you would put forward as to why this is something that is really going to help them and help their clients? Uh, happy to jump in there, uh, Brendan. So f- firstly, I just happen to believe that whether you're a small, medium, large business, that growth is important. Um, as a result of that, I happen to believe that the key anchor to not enabling growth is not having that capacity release, being held back from not having an investment philosophy and therefore getting pulled back below the line. I think it's the freedom release that advisors seek to get on with the other areas that where they really add value to their clients. So I hope if we've achieved one thing today, it's helping the listeners to understand why an investment philosophy is important. Uh, if you wanted to pivot the conversation to how, you've got to start somewhere. And, and I don't think I've ever seen a perfect investment philosophy that couldn't be expanded or improved in some way. So something's better than nothing. You know, bullet points is better than nothing. Uh, a a six-slide PowerPoint is better than uh, a one-page bullet point. So starting somewhere and, and working on that. Now, whether that's with a business coach, uh, whether that's, you know, it's probably best not to do that with an asset management firm because the asset management firm might help steer that philosophy down a path that's more conducive to their model rather than the best outcome for that practice. Um, you know, perhaps it's an independent asset consultant um, you know, someone that's got experience. Uh, you know, maybe it's a it's a fellow financial advisor that's got experience in this space. Uh, uh, as an example, but yeah, I, I think today was all about covering off the why and touching on a couple of points around the uh, the what and the how. Thanks, David. But, and Catherine, what about for you? Yeah, I it's it's hard to say because you know so many people have great businesses, and I hate to be the person who's like you should do it this way. But having said that. My sort of, I think in listening, if someone's listening to this, the takeaway is if you are losing sleep at night about markets or if you, when the market wobbles, are getting lots of phone calls from your clients, then think about how you could be doing this better because maybe that means, maybe those things are indications that your investment philosophy could be stronger and the way that you're educating your clients about it could be more robust. Um, And to David's point, if you want your business to grow and be future-proofed, then making sure that you and your business partner or your other advisors are on the same page is incredibly important because this is one of those things that can accelerate you and it also just makes it makes your life more efficient and easier. So if you've got any of those markers, then start to think about are there some of those incremental changes that I could be making to make things easier, better, more efficient, and and to grow for the future. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, David, Catherine, thank you so much for joining me. It was a great conversation, and I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and experience with the audience. Until next time, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks.